Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Have you heard that already? Oh, what a lovely day for Christmas today. And we come to serve a living Lord that made it all happen for us too. Amen? Amen. Let's sing from the bottom of our feet to the top of our heads. I want you to stand and let's rejoice in this this morning. Let's sing. Good Christians men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give heed to what we say to you. Jesus Christ is born today. Hearts and hands before Him now, and He lives in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. Joy, joy, Jesus Christ was born for this. He hath opened every door and man is blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good We want to say welcome to each and to every one of you who have joined us here this morning to worship and what a beautiful day God has given to us to be able to worship Him and I hope and pray that you're here for that reason. If you're visiting with us today and you've never filled out a visitor's card, will you slip up your hand and hold it there for a second and uh, receive a card from these men and fill it out and drop it in the offer and plate and we'll be very grateful to you for doing so. Uh, tonight's a very important time in the life of our church. We're going to have our Christmas program. Uh, the Greatest Gift begins at 6 o'clock, and all of our children are going to be participating in that, as well as some of our adults. And let me encourage you to come and be a part of our worship service tonight. Then immediately following the program, we're going to go back to Fellowship Hall and uh, have a time of fellowship together. And uh, the ladies have taken care of that already, and it's very pretty back there. So you come and be a part of our worship tonight. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful sunshine that you've sent to bless our earth today, Father, and the privilege to come into the very throne room to worship. And, Father, I thank you for every precious gift that's been given to us this year, Lord. Lord, there's so many things that we take for granted every day, but, Lord, but it's all the hand of God moving and working in our hearts and lives. And, Father, I invite you to be a part of this service today, Father, to tread the avenues of every heart to touch every life. Father, where there's sickness in the house today, Father, I pray that you'll bring healing to each and to every one. Lord, for our missionaries around the world today, Lord, would you bless them. Men and women who serve in our military, would you protect them and bring them home safely to their families. And Father, I ask you to bless Brother Wayne and the men and ladies as they lead us in worship today. And Father, will you accept our worship, Father? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Wayne. Amen. Let's continue this Christmas singing. It's so wonderful this time of year. Hymn number 200, no, 278. Angels we have heard on, I want you to stand one more time. You sing so much well. Thank you. 
I've already given away the song I want to sing this morning, Little Drummer Boy. This uh, song, a lot of times it's thought as a children's song. I've loved it all my life. And about 25 years ago when I became a Christian, it occurred to me that this song is not scripturally correct. There was no drummer boy at the manger. And it kind of made me sad. But then as I, as I read the words to it and thought about the message, this song is not scripture. But it is a parable. So y'all know what a parable is, right? Jesus used a lot of parables. It's a, a fictional story to illustrate a scriptural truth. And I found this song to be a parable. You've got this little drummer boy who has nothing to give, but yet he realizes that baby is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he wants to give something. And all he has is his drum. So what does he do? He plays his drum the best he can play it for, for Jesus. And what does Jesus do at the end? What's that line? It says, then he smiled at him. Jesus smiled at him. Okay, That little drummer boy is us as I read that. You know, you think about what do we have to give? A lot of us think, I don't have anything to offer Jesus. Oh, yeah, you do. We all have something to offer. Uh, some have lots of money. Some have talents. Some have abilities, and some just have the power of prayer. And is there anything more powerful than prayer? I don't think there is. But there's something we all can do. And at the very end, Jesus is going to smile at you, just like the little, little drummer boy got that smile from him. Uh, we're going to, uh, Mike and Ron are going to join me as we give you just our little rendition of this song. That's fit to give us. 
If you have your Bibles this morning, you'd like to follow the scripture reading, turn to Luke's Gospel, the second chapter, and let's look at verse number 11. Luke's Gospel, the second chapter, beginning with verse number 11. The thought someone wants to see from the Word of God this morning is the virgin birth. Without the virgin birth, folks, there wouldn't be any need for you and I to be here today. It would just be at naught. But because of the virgin birth, Jesus Christ died for our sins, and you and I can have life eternal in Jesus Christ. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, if it please you this morning, would you permit us to share this message with our people. Lord, may the Holy Spirit have absolute charge here of everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. In the message today, we're going to establish the importance of the virgin birth of Jesus. The virgin birth of Jesus is the most frequently attacked doctrine uh, of Scripture by critics of Christianity. The doctrine is not criticized just because it uh, is in the Bible, but because of Christianity rises and falls on its versatility. Without the virgin birth, we worship a man and not God. Without the virgin birth, we'd be worshiping a man and not God. We need to remember that. An 11th century English philosopher and theologian by the name of Ansel uh, wrote a book called Why Did God Become a Man? In his discussion of that question, uh, he lists four ways God has of making human beings. First, through the union of a man and woman. Secondly, without the union of a man and woman as he did when he created Adam. Third, without the involvement of woman when God took a rib from Adam and created Eve. And by four, by naturally, imp supernaturally empowering a man and woman who were beyond childbearing age as Abraham and Sarah. And through all of his answers were biblically based, of course, as in the fifth mean means we could add, uh, which will be our study here this morning. God could cause a child to be born without the involvement of a man, as happened with Jesus Christ being born of a virgin through the agency of the Holy Spirit. If there's anything that upsets me is when I hear the secular world or somebody say that Jesus Christ was not born by the Holy Spirit. Because, folks, I know what they're alluding to. They're trying to say that, that something, uh, you know, out of the way happened, something that, was, that we consider sin happened. But let me tell you something, folks, there was not a spot, not a blemish in any kind of way in the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I believe that with all my heart. It was deemed and due by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are, there are many Christians today who are confused about the virgin birth. They associate it with something called the Immaculate Conception. However, that doctrine of Immaculate Conception is not a biblical doctrine, but it was created by Pope Pius IX in 1858. And this doctrine proposed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, from the moment of her own conception in her mother's womb, was conceived without original sin. And this plus her uh, put her on a plane with Adam and Eve and Jesus Christ himself. And the problem is that there's no biblical evidence or support for this doctrine whatever. The virgin birth of Christ, however, is clearly biblical, but it has nothing to do with Mary being immaculate or sinless herself. It's all due to the Holy Spirit of God. Now other Christians refer to Jesus' birth as miraculous. And, and it was. But folks, there were many other miraculous births in human history, such as Isaac and John the Baptist, both born to parents beyond childbearing age. Jesus' birth is far more miraculous. It stands alone in all human history as the only time a virgin has conceived a child without the participation of a man. Because Jesus was conceived by the agency of the Holy Spirit, uh, God, and, and yet born of a woman, he is the only person that's ever exists with two distinct yet complete natures, human and divine. This morning, folks, Jesus Christ is 100% uh, divine. He is 100% human because the Holy Spirit conceived in the life of Mary. Now, the virgin birth is better described as a virgin conception. The birth itself is not uh, a virginal part of the birth. It was Mary's conception at, uh, as a virgin that makes Jesus' conception a supernatural event. Now, the birth of Jesus 
has been attacked for 2,000 years by critics of the Word. It has been attacked not just because the Bible, uh, but because it is the keystone of the Christian faith. If you take the virgin birth away this morning, we would not even need to be here today. Again, it would be a man dying for a man. And that's not the way it is at all, folks. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for you and for me that we could have life eternal in Jesus Christ. Then we see also, let's look at the doctrine, that direct prophecy of the Old Testament. If you look in the scriptures in Isaiah, the 7th chapter, verse 14, it says, And behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Matthew in his gospel account says that Jesus' birth was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And, and Matthew and, and Isaiah both have been attacked by critics of the Word of God as much as any other passage in Scripture. But there are many reasons to believe that Isaiah 7.14 speak, is speaking of Jesus. The, first, the Hebrew word, uh, ama, which means a young woman has not known a man, a pure woman. And, and then the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, was made in the third century, and the Greek scholars chose the same word. That means that this woman had not known a man. And it translates, of course, uh, what Isaiah is saying, that, that Mary was that person, that virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew was completely convinced that the birth of Jesus was fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14 when he said so all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying folks this this critical issue here is not just the virgin birth but is that reliability of the word of God if, if we don't believe this morning that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin we don't we can't believe the rest of the word of God because you can't pick and choose. It's the Word of God this morning that, that is reliable here. And, and it's correct. And, and if it were not so, then how could we trust any part of the Word of God? You cannot pick and choose. Then the doctrine of divine proof in the New Testament. Matthew 1 says, I have found that there are six different ways in which the virgin birth is supported. First of all, if you look on in the chapter in verse 18... Specifically says that Mary's conception occurred before she, that they, Mary and Joseph, came together. That she was found with child of the Holy Spirit before they were married or had been joined together physically. Then she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, verse 18 again. Also says that Mary was pregnant, found with a child of the Holy Spirit. And there was no question that Mary had conceived a child before she and Joseph were married. Then the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Verse 20. Tells about the angel of the Lord appearing to Joseph in a dream uh, to calm his fears about uh, Mary's pregnancy. This wouldn't have happened unless Mary had been pregnant. And the angel told Joseph, this which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Then the virgin shall be called, shall be with child. Verse 23. And we've already touched on this, that the virgin shall be with a child. But let me point out, Right here, there's a paradoxical nature of this statement. How can a virgin with a, be with a child? From a human perspective, it's impossible. But God breaks that human realm and performs a miracle, and then it's entirely possible. And, and this is what the Bible says, that God, by the Holy Spirit, caused a virgin Mary to conceive a child. Amen and amen. Then they shall call his name Emmanuel. Verse 23 again. It, this verse is a veiled reference to the virgin birth in, in the name given to the baby, Emmanuel. That name means that God is with us. And folks, this morning, if God's not with us here in the house of the Lord, we need to go home. But when God's in the house with us and he's here with us and, and great and wonderful things can happen and he can do it because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. We can trust God all the way through eternity. God becoming a human, being born of a human mother, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Then he's the Son of God. If Jesus Christ could see by the Holy Spirit, this negates the, the involvement of a human father. He was not the son of Joseph in, in the natural procreative sense. Instead, he is the Son of God. 
And this fact, folks, does not deny his pre-existence as the Son of God. Dr. Harry Raymer, in his book, The Magnificent Jesus, tells about being part of a committee who was examining a young man who was wanting to be ordained into the ministry. During that examination, it came out that the young man didn't believe in the virgin birth because it is only mentioned briefly by Matthew and Luke, never by Paul, John, and James, or Peter. And Dr. Raymer asked the young man, what part of the Bible did he not believe? He said, I don't believe in the Sermon on the Mount, he replied. Not me, said Dr. Raymer. I don't, believe in the, the, I don't believe in the Sermon on the Mount. And after all, it's mentioned only by Matthew and Luke and not by any other New Testament writers. How many times does God have to say something in order for it to be true? It occurs only once in the Scriptures, and it's true, folks. That's all it takes, one time. And, and we see that... that when the virgin birth may be mentioned only by Isaiah and Matthew and Luke, it is assumed by the entire Bible revelation concerning Jesus Christ. And if you remove that virgin birth, nothing else in the New Testament concerning Christ can stand. Because that is the bedrock, that's the basis of the redemption plan for you and for me today. Then that doctrine of, is critical to the understanding of the gospel. The gospel of salvation by Jesus Christ who who wholly depended upon that virgin birth. We have to determine our attitude toward the pre-existence of Christ. If you look at John 8, chapter, an encounter with Jesus has been uh, with some of the Jewish leaders who were challenging his teachings. And he refers to a relationship that he had with Abraham. And the Jews couldn't understand how this could be true. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham was, was past tense. And even before Jesus is present tense, Jesus said he existed before Abraham ever came on the scene. Folks, Jesus Christ has always been here because he's God the Father. Always been here. And we have to trust him with that. Jesus did not begin when he was born in Bethlehem. Had he existed in eternity prior to being incarnated in Bethlehem? This is a relation to his con conception this way. If Joseph had been the instrument of Jesus' conception, Jesus would have begun nine months before he was born. But folks, all is needed was a way for him to step out of eternity into time for 33 years. God caused that to happen by the means of the Holy Spirit. Now we have to determine our attitude toward the Scriptures. Regardless of how many times something is mentioned in the Scriptures, if we say we don't believe, we can't say we believe anything else in the Bible. Because, folks, every bit of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, relies on each other. The New Testament proves the Old Testament. The Old Testament proves the New Testament. Every bit of it is in order as God ordained it. And we, you can't pick and choose what you want to pick and choose in the Scriptures. You have to believe all of it or none of it. And if you don't believe any of it, you cannot believe in the virgin birth. Regardless of how many times, folks, we cannot pick and choose. We have to choose. Either the Bible is the true Word of God in its entirety, or it's not. When I hear folks, folks talking about not believing some miraculous part of the Bible, I want to ask them, who gets to choose? What gives you the qualifications to decide which is which and which is true and which is false in the Word of God? I tell you this morning, folks, I don't think I'm qualified, and I don't think you are either. Only God. Only God. Then we have to determine our attitude toward Christ. On many occasions when sharing the gospel, I've asked a person, what do you believe about Jesus? Many times people, especially men, will say, well, I believe that he's the Son of God. And that's the first impression, and, and, and with understanding of the non-Christians, until you realize what they meant by that description. So I began asking the question a different way. To compare Jesus being the Son of God to his Father with me being the Son of, to my Father. And folks, that creates a whole different conversation. They knew there was a difference but they didn't know what it was. Folks, Jesus Christ is our Savior today. 
We'll never get to heaven any other way except faith in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Santa Claus is great. Parties and fun and food are wonderful, and all of us enjoy those things. But the very moment we leave out Jesus, the greatest gift that's ever been given to the world, we begin to fail. We've looked, we've, we've seen the picture. It shouldn't even be that way. J. Oswald Sanders summarizes the implications of the virgin birth. If the biblical doctrine is not true, the Bible is robbed of its authority. Mary becomes unchastened. Joseph never claimed Jesus to be his son. So if he wasn't Joseph's son, who was he? Jesus' preexistence is ruled out, which negates the incarnation of God in human flesh. The explanation of his character and that miraculous power is lost. He is not the second person of the Trinity and has no power or authority to forgive sin. Some of you here this morning have shared with me how your loved ones and family have been healed or been blessed this week through surgeries and different procedures that have been done. Folks, if Jesus Christ is not on the throne, none of that would have happened. Men cannot do that. Only God, only God can answer our prayers. And then the doctrine is significant to our lives. The virgin birth is not just the theology doctrine. It imparts our lives in a practical way as Christians. The plan of God for our salvation. If you look in Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 17, we learn how salvation was brought to the human race. Death and sin entered the world through one Adam. And grace and salvation all center entered through man, Jesus Christ. And, and if Jesus had been born of two human parents, he would have inherited the sin of Adam. And folks, along with the rest of us, he would have been a sinner. But he's not a sinner. His father is the Holy Spirit. He didn't have to die, have someone die for him. He was a perfect person. His sins were never. And then the plan of God for Agaphe. In, in 2 Timothy, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, he is able to fill that role of mediator between God and man. On one hand, Jesus reaches up to heaven and grabs hold of the, the Father. With the other hand, he reaches down here and grabs hold of a poor old sinner man or woman and brings them together and saves their soul and makes a new creature out of them in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because of the virgin birth. Folks, Jesus' advocate is built on, our, on behalf of his dignity, which is built on the virgin birth. And folks, it's not a mystery, but it's, it's the plan of God. And then the plan of God unlocks the mystery of Christ's death. Growing up and learning the truths of Christianity, I remember wrestling with the concept of, of Christ dying for the sins of the whole world. But while I have not yet resolved all the mysteries of God, understanding the virgin birth of Christ helps everyone to understand the efficiency of God's Christ's death on the cross. He died sinless, spotless for you and for me. And folks, all through this Christmas season, let's never forget what Jesus Christ has done. His purpose for coming into this world was not to be the mayor of Jerusalem, not to set up an earthly kingdom and be a king here, but to be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the Savior of every man, woman, boy, and girl's soul that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed and every Christian praying, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus, will you come down here and let me help you? I won't embarrass you. I promise you I won't. I just want to pray for you. I just want to help you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You backslid. Maybe you need to come home today. He's right where you left him. Anyway, we receive church members. This is your opportunity to come. Heavenly Father, We give you this invitation now, Lord, it's yours. Father, may the Holy Spirit be able to do its work here. Lord, may the devil be defeated on every hand. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Brother Wayne? Amen. That hymn of decision is 488. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Jesus. 